Hello, welcome to chapter one of The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. Again, we started chapter one a few weeks ago, and I read it kind of in pieces. So I want to make sure I read through most of this chapter now. Um, and we'll reread a few of the pages that we read together, but some of this will be new information. So chapter one is called When Magic Ruled the World. Our purpose for reading today is to fill in page eight of our um, online journal, which is the Chichua language. So there's going to be a lot of words that come up in this chapter that you're not familiar with, you've never heard of, because it relates directly to the Chichua language in Malawi. So what you're going to do is as we read, <clears throat> as you read along with me, um, when it comes up, when one of the words come up in the Chichua language column, you're going to write over here and type what the English translation of that word is. And it actually tells you which pages it's on. So as I'm reading, the words will come up and you'll be able to pause it and enter it into your, um, on this page of page eight. So for, as I read, you'll, you'll get at least six or seven of these words today as we read through chapter one. So you should have those filled in as we go along. So follow along with me on the screen. We're going to start reading chapter one. <clears throat> My name is William Kamkawamba. And to understand the story I'm about to tell, you must first understand the country that raised me. Malawi is a tiny nation in southeastern Africa. On a map, it appears like a flatworm burrowing its way through Zambia, Mozambique, and Tanzania, looking for a little room. Malawi is often called the warm heart of Africa, which says nothing about its location, but everything about the people who call it home. The Kakawambas hail from the center of the country, from a tiny village called Masatala, located on the outskirts of the town of Wimbe. You might be wondering what an African village looks like. Well, ours consists of about ten houses, each one made of mud and bricks and painted white. For most of my life, our roofs were made from long grasses that we picked near the swamps, or dambos, hint, hint, in our Chichua language. The grasses kept us cool in the hot months, but during the cold nights of winter, the frost crept into our bones and we slept under an extra pile of blankets. Every house in Masatala belongs to my large extended family of aunts and uncles and cousins. In our ha house, there was me, my mother and father, and my six sisters, along with some goats and guinea fowl and a few chickens. When people hear I'm the only boy among six girls, they often say, Eh, Bombo, which is like saying, Eh, man, so sorry for you. And it's true. The downside to having only sisters is that I often get bullied in school, since I had no older brothers to protect me. And my sisters were always messing with my things, especially my tools and inventions, giving me no privacy. Whenever I asked my parents, Why do we have so many girls in the first place? I always got the same answer. Because the baby store was all out of boys. But you'll see in this story, my sisters are actually pretty great. And when you live on a farm, you need all the help you can get. My family grew maize, which is another word for white corn. In our language, we lovingly referred to it as chim chimanga. And growing chimanga required all hands. Every planting season, my sisters and I would wake up before dawn to hoe the weeds, dig our careful rows, then push the seeds gently into the soft soil. When it came time to harvest, we were busy again. Most families in Malawi are farmers. We live our entire lives out in the countryside, far away from cities where we can tend our fields and raise our animals. Where we live, there are no computers or video games, very few TVs, and for most of my life, we didn't have electricity. Just oil lamps that spewed smoke and coated our lungs with soot. Farmers here have always been poor, and not many can afford an education. Seeing a doctor is also difficult, since most of us don't own cars. From the time we're born, we're given a life with very few options. Because of this poverty and lack of knowledge, Malawians found help wherever we could. Many of us turned to magic, which is how my story begins. You see, before I discovered the miracles of science, I believed that magic ruled the world. Not magician magic, like pulling rabbits out of hats or sawing ladies in half, the sort of thing you see on TV. It was an invisible kind of magic, one that surrounded us like the air we breathe. In Malawi, magic came in many forms. 
the most common being the witch doctor, whom we called Singanga. The wizards were mysterious people. Some appeared in public, usually in the markets on Sundays, sitting on blankets spread with bones, spices, and powders that claimed to cure everything, from dandruff to cancer. Poor people walked many miles to visit these men, since they didn't have money for real doctors. This led to problems, especially if a person was truly sick. Take diarrhea, for example. Diarrhea is a common ailment in the countryside that comes from drinking dirty water, and, if left untreated, it can lead to dehydration. Every year, too many children die from something that's easily cured by a regimen of fluids and simple antibiotics. But without money or faith in modern medicine, the villager takes his chances with the Sanganga's crude diagnosis. Oh, I know what's wrong, the wizard says. You have a snail. A snail? I'm almost positive. We must remove it at once. The wizard goes into his bag of roots, powders, and bones and pulls out a light bulb. Lift up your shirt, he says. Without plugging the bulb into anything, he moves it slowly across the person's stomach, as if to illuminate something only he can detect. There it is! Can you see the snail moving? Oh yes, I think I can see it. Yes, there it is! The wizard returns to his bag for some magic potion, which he splashes across the belly. All better? he asks. Yes, I think the snail is gone. I don't feel it moving. Good. That will be 3,000 kwacha. For a little extra money, the Sanganga can cast curses on your enemies to deliver floods to their fields, hyenas to their chicken house, or terror and tragedy into their homes. This is what happened to me when I was six years old, or at least I thought it did. I was playing in front of my house when a group of boys walked past carrying a giant sack. They worked for a nearby farmer tending his cows. That morning, as they were moving the herd from one pasture to another, they discovered the sack lying on the road. Looking inside, they saw that it was filled with bubblegum. Can you imagine such a treasure? I can't begin to tell you how much I loved bubblegum. Now, as they walked past, one of them spotted me playing in a puddle. Should we give some to this boy, he asked. I didn't move or say a word. A bit of mud dripped from my hair. Eh, why not, his friend said. He looks kind of pathetic. The boy reached into his bag and produced a rainbow of gumballs, one of every color, and dropped them into my hands. By the time the boys disappeared, I'd shoved every one into my mouth. The sweet juices dribbled down my chin and stained my shirt. Little did I know, but the bubble gum belonged to a local trader, who stopped by our house the next day. He told my father how the bag had dropped from his bicycle as he was leaving the market. By the time he circled back to look for it, the bag was gone. The people in the next village told him about the herd of boys. Now he wanted revenge. I'm going to see the Singanga, he told my father, and whoever ate that bubblegum will be sorry. Suddenly I was terrified. I'd heard what the Singanga could do to a person. In addition to delivering death and disease, the wizards controlled armies of witches who could kidnap me during the night and shrink me into a worm. I'd even heard about them turning children into stones, leaving them to suffer an eternity in silence. Already, I could feel the Singanga watching me, plotting his evil. With my heart racing, I ran into the forest behind my house to try to escape. But it was no use. I felt the strange warmth of his magic eyes shining through the trees. He had me. At any moment, I would emerge from the forest as a beetle or a trembling mouse to be eaten by the hawks. Knowing my time was short, I hurried home to where my father was plucking a pile of maize and tumbled into his lap. It was me, I shouted, tears running down my cheeks. I ate the stolen gum. I don't want to die, Papa. Please don't let them take me. My father looked at me for a second and shook his head. It was you, eh? He said and kind of smiled. Didn't he realize I was in trouble? Well, he said, and his knees popped as he rose from his chair. My father was a big man. Don't worry, William. I'll find the traitor and explain. I'm sure we can work something out. That afternoon, my father walked five miles to the traitor's house and told him what had happened. And even though I'd only eaten a few of the gumballs, he paid the man for the entire bag, which was nearly all the money we possessed. That evening after supper, my life having been saved, I asked my father if he truly believed I was in trouble. He became very serious. Oh, yes. We were just in time, he said, then started laughing so hard his chair began to squeak. William, who knows what was in store for you? 
My fear of wizards and magic only grew worse whenever Grandpa told stories. If you saw my Grandpa, you might think he was a kind of wizard himself. He was so old that he couldn't remember the year he'd been born, so cracked and wrinkled that his hands and feet looked as if they were chiseled from stone, and his clothes! Grandpa insisted on wearing the same tattered coat and trousers every day. Whenever he emerged from the forest, puffing on his hand-rolled cigar, you'd think one of the trees had grown legs and started walking. It was Grandpa who told me the greatest story about magic I'd ever heard. Long ago, before the giant maize and tobacco farms came along and cleared away our great forests, when a person could lose track of the sun inside the trees, the land was rich with antelope, zebra, and wildebeest, also lions, hippos, and leopards. Grandpa was a famous hunter, so good with his bow and arrow that it became his duty to protect his village and provide its meat. One day while Grandpa was out hunting, he came across a man who'd been killed by a poisonous pit viper. He alerted the nearest village, and soon after, they returned with their witch doctor. The Singanga took one look at the dead man, then reached into his bag and tossed some medicines into the trees. Seconds later, the earth began to move as hundreds of vipers slithered out of the shadows and gathered around the corpse, hypnotized by the spell. The wizard then stood on the dead man's chest and drank a cup of potion, which seemed to flow through his feet and into the lifeless body. Then, to Grandpa's amazement, the dead man's fingers began to move, and he sat up. Together, he and the wizard inspected the fangs of each snake looking for the one had bitten him. Believe it, Grandpa told me. I saw this with my own eyes. I certainly believed it, along with every other story about witches and things unexplained. Whenever I went down to the tra dark trails alone, my imagination spun wild. What scared me most were the ghoul Wamkulu the magical dancers that lived in the murky shadows of the forest. They sometimes appeared in the daylight, performing in tribal ceremonies when we Chua boys became men. They were not real people, we were told, but spirits of our dead ancestors sent to roam the earth. Their appearance was ghastly. Each had the face and skin of animals, and some walked on stilts to appear taller. Once I saw one scurry backward up a pole like a spider. And when they danced, it was as if 1,000 men were inside their bodies, each moving in the opposite direction. When the Gulwamkulu weren't performing, they traveled the forests and dambos looking for young boys to take back to the graveyards. What happened to you there, I never wanted to know. Whenever I saw one, even at a ceremony, I dropped everything and ran. Once, when I was very young, a magic dancer suddenly appeared in our courtyard. His head was wrapped in a flour sack, but underneath was a long nose of an elephant and a gaping hole for a mouth. My mother and father were in the field, so my sisters and I ran for the bush, where we watched the dancers snatch our favorite chicken. Unlike the ghoul Wamkulu or Singanga in the market, most witches and wizards never revealed their identity. In the places where they practiced their magic, mystery abounded like strange weather. In the nearby town of Nichisi, Men with bald heads standing as tall as trees walked the roads at night. Ghost trucks traveled back and forth, approaching fast with their headlights flashing and engines revving loud. Yet when the lights finally passed, there was no truck attached. In one of the neighboring villages, I heard about a man who'd been shrunk so small by a wizard that his wife kept him in a Coke bottle. In addition to casting spells for curses, the Singanga often battled one another. At night, they piled aboard their planes and prowled the skies looking for children to kidnap as soldiers. The witch planes could be anything, a wooden bowl, a broom, a simple hat, and each was capable of traveling great distances, Malawi to New York, for example, in a single minute. Children were used as guinea pigs and sent to test the powers of rival wizards. Other nights, they'd visit camps of other witch children for games of mystical soccer, where the balls were human heads stolen from people as they slept. Lying in bed at night, I would become so frightened thinking about these things that I'd cry out for my father. Papa, I'd shout, summoning him to my door. I can't sleep. I'm afraid. My father had no place for magic in his life. To me, this made him seem even stronger. As a devout Presbyterian, he believed that God, not Juju, was his best protection. Respect the wizards, he would tell me, straightening my bed covers. But remember, William, with God on your side, they have no power against you. And that's where we're going to stop for today. If you go to our journal, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to fill in all the way up to Gut Wamkulu, up to page 13, 
and insert the English translations for those Chichua language words.